Next, let's go through how the body controls sodium. And in a general sense, we can realize that the JG cells and MD cells will be involved because they're located in the kidney and also substantially help regulate fluid volumes. Since fluid volumes are essentially regulated by noting sodium, these then act as sodium sensors. If there's too little sodium, as in hyponatremia, the JG cells will sense less stretch because less sodium also means less water. Less sodium water means less fluid, so less blood pressure. Lower blood pressure then is going to be sensed by less stretch at the JG cells that are surrounding the afferent arterial and the glomerulus of the nephron of the kidney. In response, they're going to release renin, which will increase absorption of sodium. And this will bring back the sodium to homeostasis, so it will correct the hyponatremia. Other cells are the macula densa cells, which find less sodium in the filtrate at the collecting duct. They will interpret this to mean either a low GFR as all the sodium is at time to get back into the blood, so GFR was so low that sodium leaked back into the paratubular capillaries, or there was less sodium in the diet to begin with. In either case, they're going to stimulate the JG cells, so they're going to come over and talk to the JG cells. Remember, the macula densa cells are the cells right in the distal convoluted tubule between the afferent and the efferent, and they're right next to the JG cells. So they can easily stimulate the JG cells to release more renin. They may also dilate the afferent to increase the GFR to increase glomerular filtration rate. They may also dilate the afferent to increase GFR, which will cause more filtrate to be made, but this is going to be overshadowed by the strong effects of renin. Lastly, ADH is potently able to match sodium to water. So if there's a decrease in sodium, the posterior pituitary will release less ADH, less water will be reuptaken, and sodium concentration will increase. Next, let's do if there's too much sodium. Again, the JG cells and the MD cells will play a major role here. But there's a couple of other mechanisms, too. I'm realizing that I don't have JG on here, and I should have JG, because what the JG cells are going to do is if there's too much sodium, there's probably going to be too much water. That means there's going to be stretch to the JG cells, and they're going to stop releasing renin in response to that stretch. I apologize that this is not on there, but it should have had JG cells. I do have the MD cells, because what they're going to do, the macula densa cells, are going to sense too much sodium at the distal convoluted tubule. And this is going to be interpreted as a lot of sodium in the diet, or could mean a high GFR. High GFR, because we flowed, the fluid flowed through the tubule system too fast to allow sodium reabsorption, and so that would indicate a high blood pressure and a high GFR. In either case, the macula densa cells are going to signal to constrict the afferent to slow down GFR, they're also going to inhibit the JG cells to get rid of renin, get rid of fluid, get blood pressure back down, and slow that GFR back down. As with hyponatremia, ADH is really potently able to match sodium water. So if there's an increase in sodium concentration, the posterior pituitary will release additional ADH to increase water reabsorption. Interestingly, while this ADH response is primarily initiated by the hypothalamus, this initiation can be stimulated by decreases in blood pressure and decreases in blood volume sensed by baroreceptor reflexes. That's what I have written right here. And so if there's a decreased blood pressure or decreased baroreceptor reflex, then that can also stimulate the release of ADH to get the water levels back up. So in hemorrhage or other severe decreases in blood volume or increases in plasma osmolarity, the signal to release ADH can come from outside the hypothalamus as well as the posterior pituitary. The remaining mechanism, which only really deals with too much sodium, is hypothalamic thirst and ANP, or atrial natriuretic peptide. First of all, the hypothalamus, if plasma volume increases by 1%, or blood volume decreases by 10%, the hypothalamus can stimulate thirst. Interestingly, angiotensin II, which we learned about when we did the Renin Cascade, also has been found to stimulate thirst. So if angiotensin II has been released by the Renin Cascade, it will also stimulate water reuptake through thirst. An important thing about the thirst reflex is it's going to end quickly if the mucosa of the mouth is wetted or the stomach stretches. This alleviation occurs quickly so that water intoxication does not develop. You want a quick signal that you've drank some water. You don't want to keep drinking water while you wait for the plasma osmolarity to go back down. Otherwise, we could drink too much water, leading to a dilution of all of our ion water intoxication. The last one is ANP, or atrial natriuretic protein. This is a protein released by the right atrium when there's an increase in blood pressure. And here, we're not necessarily sensing increased sodium. We're sensing the increased water that often comes with increased sodium. And that will cause the release of AMP that goes down to the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct and inhibits the renin system. And by inhibiting the renin system, we'll lose sodium, we'll cause blood vessels to dilate, and we'll get our blood pressure back down. 
So just to wrap this up, I hope you can see that sodium has quite a few roles to play in the body, very important roles. And because those roles are so important, sodium concentration needs to be controlled really, really well. If they weren't controlled, we'd be very prone to death by sodium imbalances due to the effects of sodium on the way neurons work, the heart works, other muscle works, respiratory system works, and reuptake from the kidneys. So sodium is well controlled because it really has to be well controlled. Thank you.